thank you all for coming uh, to this uh, month's version of the Money Laundering Research Network seminars. We are very glad to have uh, Rajiv Gundur here uh, presenting a recent paper on the, low, on the uh, money laundering activities of uh, small to medium uh, sized illicit drug enterprises. Um, we have about 20 minutes for the presentation of the paper itself that's recently been uh, published in Trends in Organized Crime. And then we have about 20 minutes uh, discussion with the discussant, uh, which we are happy to have here, uh, John Corkins. And then we open up the floor uh, to uh, the more the bigger audience uh, for the last 20 minutes. All this timing is not set in stone, so we are a bit flexible there, but I'll try to uh, keep uh, the speakers to, uh, to these uh, time uh, schedules. Uh, Rajiv, the floor is yours. Okay. Well, thank you so much for having me, and especially thanks to Mirko, who first reached out to invite me to present. And congratulations, Mirko, on defending your PhD. Yeah. That's an amazing <laughs> accomplishment. Uh, I'm super proud to see uh, you finish that. So to introduce myself to those of you who haven't met me, my name is Rajiv Gundur, and I am a researcher <laughs> who focuses on illicit enterprise. I consider myself, I guess, an expert more so in the drug trade and an emerging expert in cybercrime. I've recently found myself examining issues of fraud and financial crime in digital spaces and recently completed this international diploma in AML with ICA in order to allow myself the credibility to talk about money laundering in a, in a more systematic way. My best work is in my book, Trying to Make It, which you can see pictured here. Now, how did this paper come about? I think is an important question. Please mute your microphone. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. So how this project came about is, is something that I'd like to tell you. So I wrote this paper with two colleagues, Mark Berry at Bournemouth University and Mike Salinas, who's at uh, Manchester Met. And we all studied the drug trade. We did this not in a systematic way. Our projects were completely different. But as we were sitting around at a conference talking about what we had learned, we found out that we were exposed to very similar stories in terms about how our respondents talked about money. All of us used ethnographic methods. I did my research on the US-Mexico border and elsewhere in the US, and the other two did the research primarily in the United Kingdom. Uh, Mike did some more research in Spain as well. And what we found is that even though money was not part of our original focus, people talked about it all the time. And most folks were not of this easy come, easy go mentality that we might see expressed on television or in terms of popular culture. And we found that the people who we were engaging with in our research, when we saw them think about their business, we saw them think through how to manage their money and their assets. So we understood that we had something here that wasn't really part of the literature as such. And we wanted to present our findings in these sort of lower echelons of the drug trade in talking about money, the proceeds of crime and laundering processes. So we start in this paper by talking about four different types of money launderers. We have these passive self launderers. And these are people who directly launder the proceeds of crime by purchasing goods, licit or illicit with the money that they generate from their crimes. So this could be somebody who is simply going out and purchasing what they need. They could be buying diapers, they could be buying food, they could be buying a pair of shoes, it doesn't really matter. They might be buying other quantities of illicit goods whether it's drugs or maybe guns or so on with the proceeds of their crime. They don't have in these purchases a lot of scrutiny happening right from outside actors. We don't see police or regulators or banks that are going to be worried about these types of transactions in any meaningful way. And these types of transactions generally are not captured in the estimates of money laundering, which are ridiculous as they stand anyway. 
Then we move on to talk about active self launderers. And these are people who engage in some kind of multi-step process to hide the provenance of their funds. They often launder the proceeds of crime with legitimate businesses or using investments. We see that these individuals are probably those who make a little bit more money and understand that to be able to purchase higher price tag items, they need to demonstrate that the money that they have comes from a quote unquote legitimate source. We also have opportunistic launderers, and these are people who use friends or family members to facilitate the laundering process. This is a little bit different than active self launderers. They're engaging in similar processes, but having other people do those processes for them. These are processes that help layer funds and engage in the rest of the laundering process. And then we, of course, have professional launderers who I'm not going to talk about today. And these are the skilled launderers who can launder hundreds of thousands of dollars or more. Okay. So we think that understanding these types of money launderers is important. And it's also necessary to remember that just because somebody is one of these types of launderers at one point in time doesn't mean that these categories are mutually exclusive. There is certainly some overlap in the everyday dealings. Now, there are these small scale illicit entrepreneurs, in our case, the drug retailers or small scale drug wholesalers who we were talking to. And many of these people were engaging in passive self laundering. They probably made, particularly the retail folks, a few hundred dollars a week, often much less than that. And we can see the kinds of things that these retailers would spend their money on. This is Ryan, who is a UK-based cocaine retailer. He said, selling cocaine enables me to run my car, to see my daughter, to put food in the cupboard. So that's the main things, really. I can't even say it's enough to cover to buy clothes or things like that. These individuals don't have an active laundering strategy. They're not thinking about that. Even though they're disposing the proceeds of their crime and could be charged with money laundering, that's not their thought process. Depending on the proceeds of crime, they are using their money to buy, as I said, everyday necessities. Some of them, of course, use it to buy designer clothing. And sometimes they are able to save this money and present it as a deposit, particularly if they have illicit source of income. We see that they prioritize how they spend their money and how they use their money. This is Linus, a, a US-based cocaine retailer. I always separate my re-up money from my profit money. My re-up money was first. So when I made my re-up money, I went and bought me another eight ball and then my profit came last. So he understood the prioritization of purchases in order to keep his small retail business afloat. I think that Understanding that folks are rational actors and making decisions in order to stay in business is a theme that we're going to see consistently throughout this presentation. As people start to get more money and they need to be able to come up with some kind of narrative in terms of where this money came from in order to be able to use that, they start to think about engaging in some form of active laundering. I'm talking about individuals who are probably making hundreds or the low thousands of dollars. They start to realize, okay, this is more than what I can spend using just cash purchases. Uh, perhaps there's purchases that require a few thousand dollars that can be evidenced, as I said, through passive laundering, particularly if somebody has a regular job, maybe they, they sell uh, retail clothes and they have some income and they just don't spend that income. The scrutiny over the percentage that they're saving of their income doesn't tend to be particularly stringent. So that could be one way that they still engage in passive laundering. But generally speaking, when folks are trying to buy things like houses or more expensive cars, they need to engage in more active processes. These individuals often launder money using legitimate processes. And one of the most common legitimate processes is to report the proceeds of their crime as taxable income. So they effectively might have a, a cash heavy business or a business that has a lot of clientele, a lot of receipts where they might be able to take cash payments and they simply say, okay, I made this amount of money with my normal job. I have, I've been doing a lot more work. Maybe they're an electrician or a builder and they're doing small jobs and they create this paper trail, they report it to the tax man, they pay 
whatever tax bill they have, and then boom, they have money which they pay taxes on. And interestingly enough, they're not engaging in money laundering. Uh, sorry, they're not engaging in tax evasion by by paying their taxes. So they're they're actually reducing the the the, the array of crimes that they might be charged with in in this process. We see Charlie, who was distributing performance enhancing drugs, talk about the people who he liaised with in China and the distributors in the UK in, in the ways that they reported their income. At their level, they are happy to pay the tax bill. They are happy to pay a four grand a year, five grand a year tax bill, but then it benefits them because the more they pay, pay in taxes, and then the more that they can borrow from the banks. So we see that sometimes by generating this income, they are able to start to pivot into a veneer of legitimacy within the business community. We also saw opportunistic launderers who use proximal relationships. They might have folks engaged in straw man purchases to buy a car or to buy a house. They would have people behave as money mules moving currency from one location to another. Oftentimes this opportunistic laundering created what I call cutouts, right? And so these are individuals who become dead ends to investigators. Effectively by having these proximal relationships which are built on trust, maybe through kinship ties or through strong friendships, if the person who is engaging in the laundering process gets caught, they are less likely to roll on the person who is uh, who, who they're laundering the money for. And so this limits the ability for law enforcement to work up the chain. Smart launderers will use people who are a step removed. We see this in cybercrime actually with the use of money mules in terms of trying to convince people that they're doing some kind of altruistic process when in fact that they are simply transacting the proceeds of crime. Sometimes this opportunistic laundering can venture into racketeering. We saw an example of someone forcing his clients to use their bank accounts in order to transact money on his behalf. This is Teeth, the very person that I was talking about. He also ensures that he is completely invisible in terms of pro-social society. I don't keep anything in my name. I sublet. I'm not on the voters list. Even the social People don't know where I live. I put myself down as homeless. So Teeth had his clients use their bank accounts to do all of his transacting. He didn't have a debit card, didn't have a credit card, did cash transactions wherever he could. But in the event that he could not use cash, he made other people use their debit cards or their credit cards. Um, he would also force people to repay him uh, by, by withdrawing their benefits from the cards that they were provided from the government. We see that laundering is a risk mitigation strategy for many people, right? So money laundering is a, an exit strategy. Uh, people try to become legitimate. They seek to invest the proceeds of their crime into illicit business. Many continue to engage in illegal activities, but at a reduced rate, maybe they engage in illegal activities that they view as being less risky or that require a decreased amount of involvement. We also see people who just leave, right? They seek to invest proceeds of crime into licit business and a licit future. This licit income that they generate with their new businesses, it could be a restaurant, a store, a whole host of licit businesses which have this sort of cash infusion to get them off the ground. The proceeds of those licit businesses don't have to be as good as their illicit proceeds to get them to completely exit and leave a life of offending, I think that the, the issue at hand is ensuring that they are able to have a stable income that meets their needs. Now, after I published this paper with my colleagues, I had an illuminating conversation. I want to throw this wrench into the works. So I had this conversation with Margarito Flores Jr., who some of you might know as being one of the most prolific drug distributors in American history. He and his brother cooperated with law enforcement in the Chapo Guzman trial. And he reached out to me after I published my book and we've had several conversations. He 
told me that even though he was dealing with millions of dollars a month, he did not engage in a lot of the laundering processes that we kind of assume are commonplace when we think about AML controls. The way that he moved most of the money from the United States to Mexico was on a semi truck. And he made a comment that of all of the loads of drugs that he trafficked into the US, he lost a certain percentage. Of all of the loads of cash, which he moved back into Mexico, he never lost a truck. And he wasn't nearly as careful because he understood that there was no oversight in terms of the vehicles moving south. So the transportation of bulk cash is common in his view and is sparsely policed. So we start to see actually once the cash is moved back into a different economy and redistributed, then a lot of this sort of self laundering type of process can work and folks who might want to get paid will simply accept dirty money, uh, particularly if they're in a jurisdiction that doesn't have good oversight or if they have the capacity to make the cash purchases without needing to go through the normal controls. The wives of the Flores twins are both currently in prison. They pleaded out to money laundering last year. And both of these women engaged in processes which were effectively self-laundering processes. They uh, paid for the tuition of their children to go to school. They invested in small businesses that um, they would run. They bought different items that they, they needed. They did buy uh, various goods, but certainly the types of things that we think about in terms of complex laundering structures, that's not what these women were engaged in. I pose a question because I think that as I, I thought about this trajectory, the Flores twins are, are very unusual. They had the ability to buy whatever they wanted, quite, quite literally, and they lived lifestyles which at times were quite opulent. I think that many of the people who we interviewed never reached a level of opulence that was anywhere close to the Flores twins. And so when they had opportunities to leave offending and legitimate their everyday actions, they took them. And one of the questions I might pose just as a thought exercise is at what point does a monetary position become one that is a point of no return, which means that folks are so accustomed to that amount of money that they are unlikely to exit offending uh, and return to a life which has a modest expenditure. Thanks for your attention. The paper is open access for those of you who are interested. Um, please download a copy and I'm excited for uh, the comments today. Thank you very much for your attention. Good. Thanks a lot, uh, Rajiv. Um, so we first go to the discussant, uh, John Cockens in this case, and then we open up the floor uh, for the rest of us. Uh, if you have a question or a comment and you cannot uh, turn on your microphone later on, feel free to already put your question or comment in uh, the chat. Then uh, I will read it out to you or Rajiv will uh, read it directly from there. But first we go to uh, John. OK, well, uh, thank you for giving me the chance to uh, read the paper and comment and participate uh, today. I enjoyed the paper quite a bit um, and I'll pause there. You guys do see the PowerPoint, I hope. Yeah, yeah, excellent. Yeah, so I thought the paper was great. Uh, it's extremely well written. It is clear and it concretely makes an empirical point and without overreach. And uh, I get frustrated sometimes how many papers look at a, a particular set of data and then conclude that the whole world should be changed to match their ideological predilections. This is a real science paper. It uses uh, a data source that's not been uh, tapped often for this purpose to discover some specific thing that I do absolutely they characterize correctly, and so the world knows more than it did before. And when I say it's real science, that's a high compliment um, uh, uh, in my view. Um, let me pause. I no longer see my slide up there. Did I lose the sharing? Uh, yeah, we're now seeing ourselves. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, that's far more beautiful than any of the slides are, but let me see <laughs> I if agree. I get the slides back up. <laughs> yes, uh, all right, the slides are back. Okay, fantastic. Well, that was okay because the first part was just intro anyhow. 
Uh, what I'm going to do is give a few reactions to the specific empirical findings and then uh, some thoughts about next steps. The first half of the reactions are the things that made sense to me. Um, and number one is that the money laundering terminology that was developed when thinking about kingpins just doesn't apply to the lower level sellers, meaning not only the retailers, but also the low level wholesalers. So um, it's almost, it's, it's not surprising that when one develops a, a vocabulary and a way of thinking for the Bill Gates of the world, it doesn't apply to the factory workers of the world. The second thing, which in some sense is not surprising, is that the lower level folks don't use much in the way of professional money laundering services. As was just described, the lowest level retailers are essentially just passively self laundering by spending their cash proceeds. And if you go up one layer, sort of low level wholesalers, they may need to do more than that, but they don't need the professional launderers. They'll either actively self-launder, as was described, which is expensive but secure. You have to spend more of your time and energy on it, but you're doing it, so you're not sharing the risk with other people, or you recruit associates, um, the opportunistic approach. So all of that makes uh, perfect sense to me because um most of the money is made at the bottom layers of the distribution chain now the distribution chain might have six transactions between production and sale to the final uh, consumer and in a ballpark sense price doubles every step it maybe only goes up by 60 percent, but it's easy to do arithmetic with doubling and if you think about it as doubling then only a quarter of what the users spend on the drugs ever moves up the chain past the people that are the object of this study. And it doesn't mean these individuals are super rich. If you think in round terms, every time you drop a layer in the distribution network, the branching factor multiplies by 10, the number of individual organizations involved, but the price only goes up by a factor of two, then the revenue per organization or individual is divided by five each step you come down the chain. So, so these folks who, uh, none of whom are super rich, are in fact disposing of the majority of the person. So all, all that makes good sense. Um, the things that surprised me, first of all, I was surprised how much was being laundered by reporting it as legal income and paying taxes, because that's a pretty darn expensive way to launder your money ballpark, that's a 25% fee you're paying on every dollar laundered, whereas the professional money launderers, they might charge, you guys know better than I do, 2%, 5%, 8% or something. Um, so so that's a puzzle. There, there, may, there must be uh, either a lack of availability of the professional money launderers or a lack of trust in them or some other downside that would lead so many of these people to effectively pay 25% for something that the market, quote unquote, offers for 5%. And then I thought on the other hand, what, what are they not describing that I might've expected? And uh, one way, if I put myself in the shoes of someone who has to get rid of a few hundreds of thousands of dollars per year is why don't they flip more houses? Uh, Peter and I did a project in, British Columbia, where this turned out to be a common way of laundering money. You, you buy a house for $200,000, then you hire contractors to make it a much nicer house, add extensions, replace the roof and windows. Those contractors are often delighted to receive payment in cash because they'd like to pay their workers under the table. And then you sell the much improved house at a higher price and the increase in the value of the house, uh, you get to, to pocket. Um, no, apparently nobody said that they were doing that. Uh, last thing I'll say that surprised me is how many people were exiting or thinking about exiting. This may just be my error, but 
I had tended to think of the money that could be made by selling drugs as almost as addictive as the cocaine. And I had the stereotype that a lot of people stayed in the business too long. And in fact, they stayed in the business until arrested and or addicted and lose their stake. But this seemed to be a story of greater potential for upward social mobility through participation in drug selling than uh, than I had thought. But that's, those are my reactions to the empirical findings. M moving to next steps, a um, few minor suggestions for the authors, and I understand these may be late to the party because the paper is accepted. I would have loved to have seen box and whiskers plots of annual income for each of the different money laundering methods. It was stated that the passive self laundering is done by people who make less income and the more active approaches for people who make more income. That totally makes sense. I think a box and whiskers plot uh, showing amounts of money made per month or per year uh, for each of these broad strategies of laundering might be a concise way of visually communicating um, that point with these data. Uh, second suggestion is to investigate whether, and the data may not support it, the ease of passive self-laundering changed over time. So broadly speaking, people used to buy a lot of stuff with cash. Now we don't buy as much with cash. Has that broad societal change made it more difficult to passively self-launder. And, and I just don't understand uh, what time frame these data come from and whether or not it's possible to look at that. Um, my comments for the field are to encourage and celebrate more such studies. I think the authors do a fantastic job of acknowledging the limitations of these non-probabilistic uh, samples, but um, my reaction to the limitations of the data are to essentially to shrug and say, what, what do we have that's better than that? So um, I, I don't think that snootiness about non-representativeness of data should block one from looking at valuable data such as the authors did. I've already made this reference that there's a need for refining the terminology. Uh, right at the moment, we would say that if a retail seller bought a gumball, they had participated in money laundering. And no person on the street or no policymaker would embrace that kind of terminology. So I, I think the field just has to figure out some alternative terminology that maybe views at least passive self-laundering as not actually laundering, or else there's going to be a disconnect between the people inside the field who use the terminology in the highly precise way and may understand each other, but there'll be a problem communicating uh, to others. And then the, the research hypothesis that I would think the field would want to engage in is the one that I kind of just alluded to the authors might take a first look at, which is have the changes in overall use of cash in society affected the ease of conducting lower level drug selling? Um, has it become so hard to self launder now that we don't use cash for much that this is a a problem? Or conversely, are people so comfortable with Venmo that now retail sellers are conducting their transactions with Venmo? Um, I'm not sure whether or not Venmo is an international thing. It's a peer-to-peer -peer, uh, uh, cash transfer uh, uh, mechanism you, you use on your cell phone. Um, then for policymakers, I have two I will admit quite left field or out there uh, thoughts I want to put on the table. The first is we celebrate these instances in which the federal high level law enforcement penetrates money laundering operations or even sets up fake front money laundering operations as an investigative tactic to catch kingpins. Should the local police try to penetrate landlord operations to see who's paying rent? in cash. Um, is there a, an invest? It, it, so, so one thing you do with money laundering is you make money laundering so expensive, it's a burden on the industry. Another is money laundering becomes the window through which you're able to catch or prosecute uh, people. And I 
don't know whether or not there's a local police analog here where they could try to discover who's spending cash as an investigative lead. Then uh, my, my sort of craziest idea is whether or not we should let go of the idea that law enforcement can only seize assets that can be documented as having been earned illegally, as opposed to saying, if people participate in certain classes of crime that we view as very serious, but don't want to simply fill prisons with those offenders, could be drug trafficking, could be embezzlement. Um, we just say, look, uh, you commit these crimes, you don't have any right to any of the money you have. It's not our job to show which dollar came from which income source. You just essentially have to forfeit all of your assets and maybe we get to monitor your income and spending for 10 years thereafter to make sure that you didn't have a secret Swiss bank account that we didn't know about at the time of, of conviction. So um, those uh, thoughts go far afield from the paper itself. I'll just wrap up by saying this is a very nice, tight, solid paper, and I think the literature benefits from, uh, from this sort of work. So thanks for giving me the chance to comment on it. Feel free to, feel free to uh, reject, uh, uh, react, uh, Rajiv. Great, thank you so much. Uh, it's wonderful to hear the reception of our paper, uh, particularly since it was so difficult to get it out in the first place. Like as you mentioned, that you know the the type of sample that we had was not an attractive sample for a lot of the quote unquote you know top tier criminology journals, and so we definitely got pushed back uh, a couple of times as we you know on our journey to get this paper out there. And uh, I agree with you that this kind of research is the is important because it lends itself to conversations that are the here and now, the everyday in terms of what illicit enterprise looks like. Um, I wanted to pick up a couple of things that you had mentioned. Um, one is all of our research came before the pandemic, which meant that at the time, cash economies were, were still very common in all of the areas that we were doing this research. So that's something which I would expect to see some kind of difference now. And I think that would be a great project for somebody to, to pick up to understand how people navigate the ability to accept and spend money in a trade that is largely still cash based in, in, in many circumstances and, and plug into uh, increasingly cashless societies and, and whether they have to go through more stages in order to be able to spend that money uh, to have somebody front for them or, or whatever the case might be. I think uh, when we're talking about these seizures of all assets, your radical idea at the end, I, I would be against something like that just because of the current abuses that asset and cash seizure currently see, right? We see circumstances where individuals have been uh, arrested with large amounts of cash, which are legitimate, that they've struggled to uh, explain, and then they've, they've had all of that money taken from them and had to go through a legal process that they can't afford to be able to try to recover it. And so I would think that given the disparities of policing and, and the lack of transparent policing practice in many jurisdictions, I, I don't think that that would be a, a good outcome, right? We would start to see individuals who are still working in cash heavy types of economies be disproportionately impacted. And those are going to be individuals who might be living in situations which are chaotic or, or not, um, not not defined, right? I can think of of a number of odd jobs that people still earn money on, like you mentioned, right? Those those people who are working for contractors taking cash payments, right? They they might make a thousand dollars in cash in a very short period of time, and a police officer who is profiling maybe an unauthorized immigrant who doesn't have a bank account does everything through a cash economy within their small window. That person is going to be disproportionately negatively impacted by by that kind of strategy. One of the things that we didn't include in the paper because well, we were, we were told to take it out is, is actually kind of an idea, which is, is this a problem? Is, is this low level money laundering a problem or is it potentially a net benefit for certain segments of, of, of society, right? Folks who 
are engaging in the processes that we describe. They provide a service. We, we understand it to be an immoral service or, or some other sort of criminal service, but um, they're using the proceeds of their crime in order to invest positively in the community by setting up a, a pro-social business, whether it's a restaurant or a bar or um, a shop or something like this. And we see this kind of idea in terms of transitioning people uh, who work on the farming side of the drug trade, right? So I don't think it's a it's a terribly radical idea, right? When we start thinking about what becomes of cocoa farmers, what becomes of uh, opium poppy farmers, right? And and trying to get these individuals to pivot away from from developing the precursors uh, plants for those two particular trades. And so I think that there can be some useful thinking in terms of you know to what extent do we actually want to um, come down hard on an individual who has spent maybe their early 20s uh, accruing capital and now they've pivoted by their late 20s or early 30s to be a pro-social member of the community. Um, and I, I know that, that that raises a lot of, of moral debates and sort of concerns, but I, I think it's a reasonable debate to have in terms of the, the cost of policing and in incarceration and, and the rest of these other sorts of net losses that we suffer as, as a society when our, our response is to incarcerate or to, to punish everyone. So, I, you know, as a sort of food for thought, but thank you very, very much for your feedback and your commentary uh, on our paper. I, I, I know that my uh, colleagues will be delighted to hear that um, we got si high, such high praise from such an esteemed uh, person. And so thank you very much for that. You're welcome. Okay, um, I think we can open the floor to uh, the rest of the audience. So if you uh, have a question, you can raise your hand or uh, uh, post comments in the chat if you want. Um, maybe I can uh, kick it off a little bit for those that are afraid to react directly. Um, Rajiv, you mentioned a couple of times about this sample and how this can give difficulty with uh, publishing it in criminological uh, journals. Can you say a couple of words on how you selected who you interviewed, how you got to these people, and which po possible biases this could create in your selection procedure? So all of us had different recruitment strategies. And some of, uh, you know, one, one colleague uh, recruited within a community that he was familiar with and that he worked in. Uh, and so that was something that he had that sort of personal access to that I think many other researchers would not be able to replicate. Another uh, had a very similar, the other had a very similar uh, kind of experience where he had uh, interpersonal connections with, with a large number of the, of the researchers. Me, on the other hand, I didn't know anybody. And so I recruited folks using uh, Craigslist. So I put an ad up on the internet and I asked people who had been convicted of a drug trafficking offense to call me and they did. And I spoke to something like, I think it was 35 or 40 people using the ad recruitment strategy. I snowballed another maybe 25 or 30 using sort of traditional methods by you know, knocking on doors of uh, community associations, prison reentry groups, um, people who had already been in the field and, and so on. And so I think finding folks to talk to is not actually a problem if you're willing to engage in some creative recruitment. And what I found, which I thought was fascinating, is that uh, people want to tell their story and they'll tell you all kinds of things, right? And what I found from my sample is that the stories that I heard were remarkably consistent across places, within places, talking to people who were parts of organizations that were not associated. They were part of different gangs. They were of different ethnicities, came from different parts of town. And when I heard these stories, you know, a dozen times from a dozen very distinct people, it became very unlikely that what people were talking about in terms of their strategies were made up, right? Like it, it's, it's quite the conspiracy that that would be the case. So. I think that, you know, some of the, I, I think getting qualitative work out into mainstream cr criminology journals is improving over time, but it, it's still really challenging to get uh, 
to get the reviewers to understand how powerful small samples can be, particularly yeah. when you when you triangulate across uh, all of these types of places and spaces, and, uh, and and the lessons that that you can learn. Um, to the point of getting the actual numbers, that's really challenging because most most people don't keep keep ledgers. They they keep sort of mental notes in terms of how much and and memories are not very good in terms of understanding how much one had 10 years ago versus five years ago versus now. And so, you know, sort of having those sort of hard, concrete uh, uh, measures, I think, would require somebody to be more systematic and approach the data collection in, in a way which prioritized focusing on money itself. Um, but I think there's ways around it in terms of trying to get people to estimate what they bought you know, basket of goods types of analyses that we see in uh, other places, um, not just in criminology, not in criminology at all, but like, you know, in terms of understanding informal economies more, more broadly, I think that there's the methods and, and the ability to recruit in order to do this research, which, which are terribly expensive, maybe time consuming, uh, that, that I would encourage uh, the, the discipline to embrace more. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, in terms of bias, I was always thinking that the traditional method is looking at people in prison and talk about the crimes they've committed. And then we always say like, well, maybe these are the dumb ones that end up in prison and there might be a sort of selection. But what I understand from your method, there might be also people that have never been caught, but were in the past or maybe still actively uh, doing these crimes. Correct. Yeah, we find people who have never been caught. We also find people who were caught a long time ago, learn from their mistakes and haven't been caught since, right? And yeah. so, yeah, I mean, I think that who we were able to find and talk to represented um, a segment that isn't commonly researched. Yeah, yeah. Although the, the possible bias might be that you have the Western world, let's say, the, the richer countries, I, or, or is that also... Because you talked about the U.S., but are these people from the U.S. that are also committing their crimes in the U.S.? Yeah. So in, in my okay. sample, by and large, that was the case, although I did talk to uh, somebody who engaged in more professional practices, uh, money laundering for drug trafficking organizations in Juarez. Um, those strategies were distinct, and uh, he was not included in terms of what what I presented yeah. in, this, in this paper because he was a professional um, engaging in those in those strategies. Um, did anybody raise their hand for, uh, ah, Mike, uh, you're first um, on my list. Yeah, yeah, and first and last, perhaps, uh, <laughs> the, um, well, first shall be last. I mean, I'm not sure we should be so surprised. I mean, I agree, obviously, with uh, Jonathan's comments, but the, I don't think we should be so surprised. I mean, yeah where people get their money from is not that visible to most people including uh, with Yoros's comment people in the global south um even more so perhaps people in the in the global south uh, provided they don't do anything too kind of uh, exciting with it so it would only be if they were actually targeted for some reason. Uh, so what I like to think of money laundering is, well, if you were challenged, that being a conditional, how would you explain away your source of uh, wealth, particularly if we take Jonathan's draconian uh, confiscation uh, model which violates almost all human rights uh, legislation uh, in the US as well, which is why they had to change the the law on uh, forfeiture. Um, uh, but the it, it, even if we took Jonathan's uh, uh, fairly uh, tough approach um, uh, as a hypothetical strategy, that is, then, yeah, most most investigators would be put off by a sim by a fairly simple explanation. Oh, I got it from X. Um, and if you if you're lazy 
or, or you don't know how to investigate properly, uh, or you haven't been taught how to falsify hypotheses uh, rigorously, then you just swallow that and and move on. Um, it's only if you become a serious target for somebody who knows what they're doing um, and is really trying to get you perhaps to turn you as into a cooperating informant or or for, or because of or because you're dealing with Venezuelans in the US um, that you really need a very convincing explanation to defeat a serious investigation so I, I think um, it would be in the latter kind of case that people need a more sophisticated, or if they're generating a lot of uh, a lot of funds, that they would really need a, a a better kind of explanation because otherwise people are just not that interested. Yeah, the average drugs investigator or even human trafficking investigator is not that motivated to to unpack an explanation. So I would suggest as, a, as something we might be interested in, um, yeah, it might be, yeah, why do uh, m money investigators of drugs and other offenders, w when would they be motivated to do some serious work on the, uh, on the case? But you, do you want to react directly or John I want to react? Directly? Well, I just want to differentiate two things you want. The criminals want to launder money carefully to avoid coming to the attention of authorities. And then there's a second concept, which is if I'm going to get caught, can I keep the money? Um, so one of the, you were really only think about the second half of that. But but the first half is one one reason why you launder money is to not get caught by authorities. And frankly, another reason is to not get robbed by other criminals. Right. You, you don't want to have a million dollars in your living room or your robbery target. So your comment was was mostly on just one of the multiple motivations for disposing of your cash carefully. Uh, maybe we can get the floor to tip. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, good afternoon. I think this is my first money laundering research network meeting and it has been a joy. Uh, thank you. It really has been. And I, and I hesitate to say anything with Michael in the room. Um, I remember when I started my career in the City of London Police, which was nearly 40 years ago, one of the first speakers, I think, was Michael. You looked a little bit younger then and you had hair that did something <laughs> slightly different. But um, thank you for letting me join you uh, today. I'm, I'm currently with the International Compliance Association. Um, can I just pick up on the policy issues that you touched upon? Um, one of them actually, going on from Michael's or Mike's observation um, around explanation of wealth. Of course, we have got the unexplained wealth order arrangements in the UK, which goes some way towards your recommendation. So if you meet a certain criteria, if you've got convictions for certain crime, or you're a politician, you've got a large amount of um, money with you, um, then the authorities can take that. And the onus is on you to demonstrate how it was legally obtained. Now, I've been involved in those sorts of investigations, mainly at a strategic level. But what we saw was that, ironically, it was the other way around from the way, Mike, you were describing it. It was those individuals with the very large amounts of money who were the most difficult to unpick because the sorts of explanations that they would come up with were very difficult to challenge. So typically they would have concealed beneficial ownership or very often I encountered uh, assets that derived from the other side of uh, well, what's increasingly the Iron Curtain from Moscow and the like, and you just can't get beneath that. You can't get information from Moscow to demonstrate or to challenge the legitimacy of the explanations that you were being given. So there's there's kind of two there's challenges both ways, I think, around that. But if I if I may, going on to the other or one of the other observations that you had around um, 
the potential to use cash as an investigative lead. I think it's really interesting, actually, that you're thinking in that way. And and, and it kind of mirrors a, a US law enforcement mindset, perhaps more than the UK mindset. But if we reflect on the position in the UK for a moment, um, I don't know what the exact figures are, but it's nearly a million suspicious activity reports, which should be gold dust. You know, it's very similar to the sort of thing that you describe, you know, the use of cash in those circumstances that could generate a SAR. Um, how many of those SARs are meaningfully investigated and how many convictions does that lead to? Well, I, th I think a couple of years ago, we looked at the number of money laundering convictions in the UK and it was just over a thousand, I think. So it was of that order, um, nearly a million SARs, thousand convictions. Well, of course, you know, the, the figures speak for themselves. So I'm not sure how much purchase that you would get in that kind of an approach because law enforcement is just so stretched. But one thing you didn't mention, which I think might be interesting, is from a policy perspective, the financial services, the regulated entities who, of course, have a legal and regulatory obligation to look for money laundering. And they are always interested in what they would call red flags or risk indicators. And the sorts of things that you were describing help to understand the patterns of activity and help to define risk indicators. So that might be worth incorporating into the paper. But as I, as I started, I'm really hesitant to say anything with with Michael in the room. I feel like I'm in the presence of royalty. Um, but I hope that's of some value. Thank you. Thanks. It's interesting to think about cash infusions, right? Because like my, I had, I had a conversation with my mother who was an accountant for the state of Illinois Revenue Service, and and one of the the bottom lines is that the tax man just doesn't care. The the tax, the the amount of funding which goes into tax evasion investigations is negligible, and compared to you know compared to what likely happens. And so if somebody simply reports this money as business expense and creates a balance sheet with cash going in to, to start a new business. Like, it doesn't matter. There's there's no interest from the IRS or the various state revenue uh, organizations in the U.S. To, to police it. Don't care. And and I think that there's the question of, is that normatively a problem? And probably the answer is yes, right? Like, it is a problem, but the, the, the cost of the investigation is massive. And you also have to think about the competency and capacity of all of these organizations, right? Because they don't necessarily have the, the resourcing. And, and we, what I find fascinating is a lot of the lobbying which strips away IRS and similar types of organizations ability to investigate come from the business community that don't want necessarily to have their books audited with the frequency that might make them uncomfortable. Yet the little guy can, can exploit that. From, you know, and, and I think the, the moral questions are important, right? Because effectively, like, am I really concerned about this person who's laundering effectively a couple hundred thousand dollars um, to start a, a a Mexican restaurant or whatever, right? Up a mattress store, you know, probably compared to somebody who is laundering a significantly larger amount of money, like the likes that we saw with the Panama Papers of people just getting off, right? To me, that's a that's an important debate that should happen in sort of a, a public policy sort of space because what ends up happening is it's really easy to start punching down on little people, but um, are we actually doing society a favor by doing that? Or are we missing the bigger target, which is not part of this paper, but are we missing the bigger target, which is improving the way that we we police money laundering at those at those larger levels? And I know it's a challenge, right? Like, I mean, it's it's such a massive challenge. But I feel like that sort of moral impetus, which underwrites so much of the policymaking, particularly right now, just isn't there when it comes to to money laundering in 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 the, in the public arena. Well, if I could, let me 
respond. Money laundering $200,000 is not a big problem. That, that's not the damage they do to society. It's when the low-level drug dealer who carries a semi-automatic rifle murders a couple of people a year and employs 12-year-olds as lookouts. That's the damage that that person might be doing. So the concept would be use the money laundering as a way of finding the person. And then you investigate. And if it's just a run-of-the-mill dealer who never carries a gun, doesn't employ kids, that maybe, maybe they get a 15-day sentence or something. But if they're that subset of dealers who are gang leaders, violent, shooting people, you have found out about them because of their money laundering. It's not the money laundering that makes us interested in the violent criminal. It's just that the money laundering might be a way of finding that person who's otherwise difficult to locate. Yeah, I, I get that point. I think that one of the things that we found is that there's a lot less violence in drug markets than there used to be, right? No, no it, it, yeah, yeah, t t totally. That's why I did include the comment that if you investigate that dealer and that isn't the dealer who carries the gun, yeah. you're not gonna prioritize them. But it remains the case that there are a subset of dealers who are nasty. And, and I'm just agreeing with you that the reason why we might not like the person has nothing to do with whether they open a restaurant. Yeah. It, it, what we might not like about them is if they're part of that 2% of drug dealers who really do uh, destroy the quality of life in their neighborhoods. Yeah, I, I guess sort of more of my point was, is that actually one of the things that I found in my own research is that the more violent people were at the bottom end of the pay scale. So they're not actually engaging in the laundering processes. They're, they're, they might be self-laundering um, both as, you know, so when we start talking about the very violent actors, they're not, they're not mid-level people. They're not actually these people who are, who are engaging in, in larger laundering processes, propping up businesses, et cetera. And so, um, if, if I don't think that we're going to find a lot of violent actors in places where you have good rule of law arrangements will be the caveat there that are going to that are going to fit that. Now, if we start looking at places that have really poor rule of law arrangements, the story completely changes. But in the American or the British context, I, you know, and, and I'm more familiar with the American context. I won't speak on behalf of my colleagues, but certainly where I saw the violence, these were these were people who had very, very little. You know, we're talking about people who were making a couple hundred bucks a week, maybe, you know, um, and their access to weapons and the rest of this was was a function of protecting a very small block. The ones that were financially successful, one of the one of the reasons why they were financially successful, one of the reasons why they were the ones who didn't end up in prison or whatever is because, or dead, is because they learned that when you bring violence, you bring attention and attention is bad for business. So the ones that have the money to launder have figured out that they need to operate in circles that have no violence. And that's one of the interesting stories about the Flores twins is that they didn't have an army. Right. So one of the reasons why they surrendered to law enforcement, whatever it was 20 years ago now, was because they had absolutely no traditional protection mechanism with people with guns. They, they effectively ran their business based on the idea is if you did bad business for us, uh, we blackball you from, from our distribution network. Right. You can no longer do business with, with us or anybody who's associated with, with us. And that was a pretty effective way for them to to, to be able to run their business. So it's, it's, an, it's an interesting idea here in terms of the violence, but I think that we have to throw in the consideration of rule, and law, of, of rule of law um, before it becomes sort of a situation where those investigations are going to turn up the kinds of actors that you're, you're sort of expecting. So We're the uh, about to run yeah. out of time, but maybe we can have the last couple of comments now. Go ahead, uh, John. Well, as you say, so a general point here is what do we think is the empirical correlation between use of money laundering services and how nasty you are for society in other ways? I think a lot of people in the money laundering community think it's a positive association. The more money laundering, the worse they are overall. 
I had thought zero correlation, and now here's an argument that it's a negative correlation, that the people who have enough money to launder, uh, they're really actually nice folks. That strikes me as a fascinating and important empirical conjecture that maybe the next paper has to answer. Yes, very good. Um, so yeah, maybe to also end on a positive note, it seems also what was striking to me is that even when this whole money laundering system, criminalizing money laundering is completely ineffective, one thing it does do is apparently a bunch of these guys are now reporting their illegal income and are paying tax money on it. This is a sort of effectiveness or a benefit of the whole AML system uh, that <laughs> comes out of your research. So that uh, is perhaps a positive note that even when the effectiveness might be relatively low, as uh, Tim seems to suggest uh, already, uh, then at least we have this. <laughs>